I'm Peter Block, and it's Monday afternoon here at the ACC 20 World Congress of Cardiology, both virtual this year, of course. And this is a wrap up for day three on Monday. With me is Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham and Women's in Boston. Deepak, welcome. Uh, we're talking about the major trials that were covered on this day, and I'm going to start out with uh, the TICO trial. Uh, we've talked a lot about ticagrelor and novel anticoagulants the last few days here. Uh, this is a trial of ticagrelor and aspirin uh, for three months and then randomized to ticagrelor alone uh, or continuing the combination of ticagrelor and aspirin for a year. And uh, let's, you know, guess what the answer is. The answer is ticagrelor alone wins after uh, three months uh, of therapy. It's an interesting issue because we've always struggled with how much or how little we should give patients after a PCI. Uh, the incidence of stent thrombosis is relatively low, so we're talking about low outcomes regardless. But the fascinating thing about this is that a combination uh, of an antiplatelet, that is aspirin here, plus ticagrelor, produces a lot more bleeding, and bleeding is what really pushed the outcomes here. Uh, they anticipated it would be non-inferior. It turned out to be superior. Uh, and so this is very much like the TWILIGHT trial, uh, which uh, we're going to talk about in a minute. And I think it is going to be pretty much of a game changer in what we're learning about this combination. Deepak, your thoughts. So I think overall, you're right, that is TICO is very much uh, consistent with what TWILIGHT had already showed us. That is, that in patients undergoing PCI, the three months of aspirin ticagrelor followed by ticagrelor monotherapy, that is dropping the aspirin, produces ischemic outcomes that at least in the intermediate term, in about a year of follow-up after that, are roughly comparable with about half as much major bleeding. So less bleeding, similar ischemic outcomes, uh, maybe a little bit of a simpler regimen, that is one drug albeit a twice a day a dosing of ticagrelor versus two drugs. So uh, for uh, simplicity's sake, for everything other than maybe cost sake, it, it seems like a uh, winning strategy. Uh, I would, however, caution that there are a bunch of other trials that show that extended duration dual antiplatelet therapy and high ischemic risk, low bleeding risk patients are useful. So to me, the remaining challenge is how to reconcile uh, all those different data sets. It comes back to uh, clinical judgment, doesn't it? I mean, it, we're really talking about, in the, in the broad range of concepts, subsets of patients. If they're very low bleeding risk, you may be able to get away with a combination. But uh, if there is a question in your mind about whether or not these folks will bleed, a ticagrelor alone, at least to be, is probably safe. Agreed? Oh, totally. So I think in, in patients that by the eyeball test seem to be at high bleeding risk, they're dropping a DAP strategy at three months and adopting a monotherapy strategy with an ADP receptor antagonist makes a lot of sense. And the bulk of data now support that that ADP receptor antagonist should be ticagrelor. There are some other studies from Korea and Japan that looked at clopidogrel instead of ticagrelor monotherapy in that setting. Those trials were also showing uh, less bleeding and uh, non-inferiority for ischemic outcomes. But, but I think in terms of quality of data, amount of data, uh, Twilight in particular uh, takes things over the goal line for ticagrelor monotherapy after an initial three months of dual therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin. Okay, so now that you've introed the Twilight trials, we actually have two of them, Twilight Complex and Twilight Diabetes. And uh, I'm going to just take, give it to you for these two because now the combination of these trials, I think, are going to be the big game changer. Go ahead and talk about Twilight a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So twilight diabetes and twilight complex are both uh, sub-studies or subgroup analyses from the overall twilight trial. And, and the bottom line is they're consistent with the overall trial, less bleeding, similar efficacy. The point, though, is these are higher ischemic risk patients, folks with complex anatomy, complex stenting and twilight complex, and patients with diabetes and twilight diabetes. And these are each subgroups where DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, has really shined, more intense DAPT, longer duration DAPT. But as it turns out, in these particular analyses, the strategy of three months of ticagrelor plus aspirin and then drop aspirin, continue twice a day ticagrelor 
uh, seemed to be the winner. Uh, that is, you might have thought, oh, these patients are high ischemic risk for sure. BAP would be better for ischemic outcomes. But again, the ischemic outcomes were similar in both arms, but there was less bleeding, as one would expect with a ticagular monotherapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy strategy. And, you know, this does build upon global leaders. There were some uh, design issues with that trial. It, it wasn't positive overall for ticagular monotherapy, but if you looked at some subgroup analyses and went beyond the primary endpoint, there were hints there as well that the strategy of dropping aspirin might be the way to go. So I, I think at a minimum in patients that are perceived to be at high bleeding risk and, and not super high ischemic risk, probably dropping aspirin at three months makes sense. Uh, there are other tri ADAPT trials, as I said, that, that support longer duration ADAPT. And you know the study here after that initial three months went about another year or so. So we don't really know about extended duration. And in patients that are tolerating it, other trials show value of extended ADAPT. But it might be that we can get a lot of those benefits if the DAPT is omitting aspirin and continuing the potent P2Y12 receptor antagonist. That's what Twilight and Tico and these subgroup analyses from Twilight really, I think, are pointing us to. There you go. Okay, let's move on to uh, a surgical trial or a semi-surgical trial, the, the radial versus saphenous vein uh, bypass grafting issue. Which is better? Are radial artery bypass grafts truly better, not so good? Yeah, it's an important question because we still do send a lot of patients to cabbage. That's just the reality of things. And it is uh, an important analysis that was presented here. It was a patient level meta-analysis looking at radial versus saphenous. And the bottom line is radial look better, uh, lower rates of the composite endpoint, even lower rates of mortality with a p-value less than 0.05. Now, um, you know, some of the different analyses are post hoc, secondary endpoints, et cetera, meta-analysis, not just a single trial. So, you know, some uh, methodological limitations to uh, being uh, overly exuberant uh, about the findings. But having said that, I, I think the findings may make sense. Uh, uh, there are other observational data that support arterial re revascularization versus venous grafts. For sure, we know the lemma is better but there's been suggestions, at least in observational data, uh, less clear from randomized data, that multi-arterial grafts might be associated with better outcomes. And here we are seeing better outcomes with radial versus saphenous. The interesting thing was it seemed like the radials were better than saphenous, in particular with the uh, female patients. And when asked uh, why that might be during the late-breaking trial presentation, uh, what the presenter, Dr. Ganino, said, was it might be that in particular for women who on average, of course it's all averages, have smaller diameter coronary arteries than men, that it's better to use a smaller radial artery versus a super large vein graft that is anastomosed to a relatively small native coronary artery. And he mentioned that they're hoping and planning to do a trial specifically addressing these issues in women. So it could be something that does improve the outcomes, especially of women after bypass, because we know right now that for bypass surgery, unlike for stenting, uh, outcomes for women are inferior than those for men. Yeah. Well, you and I have been in this, you know, uh, angiographic game of post-surgical patients for a long time. And uh, we both uh, seem to have known, at least uh, I bet we would agree, that a great big saphenous vein going into a very relatively small artery just doesn't seem right, doesn't fit. The flows are not as good. And in fact, uh, those big saphenous vein grafts don't do as well. And the radial, uh, which is small to an arterial conduit uh, distally, which is small as you see in women, uh, may be the proper answer. It'll be interesting to see how all this plays out once we see further trials. Absolutely, I agree. I think further trials are necessary and could be very informative. There you go. So let's move to the last one, which is a Korean trial, the pre-combat trial. This is a 10-year follow-up, so really long follow-up now in the question of whether or not PCI or surgery is better for left main. And I'm going to let you finish this off, Deepak. Sure. So the bottom line here is it was 10-year follow-up, modest-sized trial, but 10-year follow-up, which is hard to get. Uh, the surgeons perhaps were better at doing that than, than interventionalists are. And there was really no significant difference in hard outcomes between left main stenting and bypass surgery for severe left main disease. So I think if one is worried about some of the recent controversy, hard outcomes, which is better for left main disease, 
in carefully selected left main patients, and they've got to be good candidates for PCI technically and medically and otherwise, I think either approach is fine in terms of hard outcomes. There was significantly higher rates of revascularization with a stent-based approach than cabbage, as every trial has shown for complex disease. So no surprise there. So I think patients and their physicians can make much more informed decisions now with this very long-term follow-up. It, it doesn't really change the fundamentals, at least of what I believe, that is, you know, most patients with really bad left main disease also have very complex other disease. And if they're otherwise a good candidate for cabbage, not at high stroke risk, not lots of comorbidities, I think they should just have cabbage. But if they have comorbidities if, or if they have a high stroke risk or if they have a very strong uh, patient preference and aversion uh, to surgery, then left main stenting is fine. Yeah, I think you and I would totally agree that if the left main looks like it's going to be relatively, and it's never really easy, but relatively easy, uh, technically, it's a go. A complex bifurcation disease, lots of other comorbidities, lots of other disease that needs to be dealt with elsewhere, particularly at the bifurcation, which can be, as you know and I know, calcified, awful, ugly looking stuff. Uh, you know, maybe not so much, but if it's uh, relatively straightforward, again, physician uh, thought about this is not a bad thing. Totally agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, and then the final trial we were going to cover was reduced EPA which uh, I uh, presented and is a subgroup analysis from the overall reduced trial that is, well, not a subgroup analysis, I guess you could say a secondary analysis, where we looked at icosapentaenoic acid or EPA levels and found a strong correlation between higher EPA levels and lower rates of ischemic events, as we saw in the trial, uh, and also significantly uh, associated with lower rates of all-cause mortality as well as hospitalization for heart failure, which in the overall trial wasn't significant for heart failure. So I think it provides some mechanistic insights into what we saw in the overall reduced trial uh, in terms of mechanism of action. Was it the lowering of triglycerides? Was it uh, changes in LDL or CRP or other stuff? It turns out, no, really the action appears to be with raising EPA levels. Yeah, so uh, Deepak, uh, should we put icosapent ethyl in the water? I think I've asked you that once before. It seems to me that every time we look at this, it gets better and better. Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think uh, in terms of what the drug is approved for, at least uh, in the U.S., it's for people with high triglycerides greater than or equal to 150, fasting or non-fasting, and either established atherosclerosis, which means pretty much the entire secondary prevention universe. It covers CAD, PAD, cerebrovascular disease, or diabetes, plus at least two other cardiovascular risk factors. So that plus the triglycerides, is that falls within the label of the drug in the U.S. But, you know, it's probably the case that the drug isn't primarily working through triglyceride reduction. I mean, it does lower triglycerides. But this analysis shows that most of the bang for your buck is coming from raising levels of EPA. And that benefit probably would apply to patients outside of the ones we included in the reduced trial. Obviously, that needs to be studied formally in, in, in future randomized trials. But I think we're sort of where we were with the first statin trials, where it looked like statins were really good in people with really high baseline LDL levels, reducing ischemic events. But then eventually, the patient populations that benefited broadened from secondary prevention to primary prevention, from super high LDL to relatively what at the time we called normal LDL. So I, I think over the next decade, the same thing will happen uh, in this field with EPA. Yeah, we're going to be hearing a lot more about this. Okay, so that'll wrap it up for Monday. There's been a fabulous meeting, even though it's been virtual. Uh, Deepak, you're terrific to spend the time with me. Thank you. No, thank you. 